we have a couple of things that we want to accomplish. One, we want to talk about OCD to help you to be able to really define what it is so that you can do an accurate assessment because the accurate assessment really becomes a part of the accurate treatment. And so that's going to be our, our focus. Um, with that said, this is going to be a little different today. We'd like you all to take out your phones. So different than other presentations, everybody take out your phone and actually turn your phone on. And then we want you to answer the question of what words come to mind when you hear OCD? Crazy, excellent, thank you, whoever responded first. Fear, repetitive, and checking. What other things come to mind? If somebody answers uh, the same response, the words get larger. And so you can th see that several people think of repetitive. Trapped, excellent, that's a good word. Uncontrolled, rigid, stuck, anxiety. Very good, we'll just take one more minute or so to see if other people have things. Clean, Con clean that's good. Consuming, I, don't, I think I overlooked that one first. That's, oh, time consuming, that's excellent because that's a good one. Excellent. Part of what we want to do today, and we're going to move on from this, and if you have others you want to put in, you're welcome to uh, continue doing that. But part of what, why we wanted to put this up is because when we have, think of OCD, we have some preconceived ideas, right? We think of, I, I really anticipated there would be a lot more hand washing. There's a little bit of hands, there's, there's washings medium sized up there, um, but oftentimes when we think of OCD, we think of germs and hand washing, right? And so, and that is a big piece of OCD for some people, but we're going to talk about how OCD shows up in a whole lot of other areas in a lot of different ways as well. Okay, so what is OCD? But OCD really is getting stuck in the cycle of between obsessions and compulsions. So we have an obsession and it creates great anxiety and we're doing a compulsion and we get stuck in a cycle that creates or that keeps circling around. And um, OCD got uh, with the DSM-5 got removed from underneath the anxiety classifications and moved into its own classification, actually. It's now under um, OCD, compulsive and related disorders, um, which is really kind of interesting. And Lauren's going to talk to us about the criteria for diagnosing. Yeah. So the DSM-5 has four main criteria that they look for when trying to diagnose someone. The first one is that obsessions and compulsions are present. And so that means that it can be 50-50 or it can be more obsessions or more compulsions. Either way, it's present. And then it has to be time consuming. And so what that consists of is that it takes up to over an hour of your day-to-day -day life and just doing those rituals or thinking about it and then the third is it's not due to a side effect. So that means that it's not something that's medical or um, like a medical condition or the result of a drug abuse. And then the fourth is that symptoms are not better explained by another disorder. And so often we see people who have anxiety or major depressive disorder or something along those lines that um, look like they have OCD, but it's better explained by the other disorder. Very good. Yeah. And then insight. So when we think of insight, we tend to think of how well someone is understanding and comprehending their symptoms and their disorder. And so people with good or fair insight are more likely to believe that what they're going through is not as realistic as the people with absent insight. And poor insight, people think that they're probably not true, but they also might be true. And so, for example... Um, someone with OCD would say, with good insight, would be like, if I don't walk my car every hour, my mom probably won't get sick. But someone with poor insight, if I don't walk my car every hour, my mom will probably get sick. And then absent insight is, if I don't walk my car every hour, my mom will most definitely get sick. And so people with good insight tend to have better, um, they're better at being treated they're just because they're easier, because they have a more, they have a better concept of what they're going through. 
some of our differential diagnoses that we need to go through when we're starting to meet with people then, um, because OCD can look like a whole lot of things, right? And so that's always the thing when somebody comes into your office of your um, meeting with them and you're thinking, is this just general worry? Is this um, uh, depression? And so we're gonna walk through a couple of those. Um, generalized anxiety, the way that the, uh, I differentiate between that and OCD is generalized anxiety has a lot of anxiety about many different areas. And OCD tends to land on a couple of areas. So OCD tends to be have a couple of core worries or core themes, um, whereas generalized anxiety goes from uh, many, many, many topics and switches around. The other thing with generalized anxiety is often, or most times, it responds to logic. You get enough information, you get enough reassurance, and your anxiety comes down. And with OCD, it doesn't work that way, right? Um, OCD, no amount of information is ever gonna solve it. Um, OCD can look a lot like an eating disorder um, because I've seen clients that, uh, I had one client that um, when they came and met with me, they were so fearful of contamination um, from foods that they only ate watermelons and bananas. And no joke, I mean, that was the only two foods that they would allow themselves to eat. That looks a whole lot like an eating disorder. But the difference is, is with an eating disorder, per, the person is concerned about a body image. And so it's um, about how they appear versus anxiety about the food itself. I also have had lots of clients that have an anxiety about allergies to foods. And so um, clients that will do very uh, limited food uh, they'll restrict foods um, and only eat a certain food, just like the uh, watermelon and uh, bananas person, because of a fear of allergy. Um, so it can look like an eating disorder, but the way we discern that difference is the body image or what's driving the fear or the, ch the behavior of eating. It can also look like a panic disorder sometimes because people with OCD get, um, can get really overwhelmed and anxious and have a panic attack. But how we discern that difference is that the panic attacks are connected to that cycle of the OCD. They're not having panic attacks apart from getting really overwhelmed and anxious um, because of the obsessions. Versus somebody with panic disorder wakes up in the middle of the night sometimes with having panic attacks. Um, illness anxiety disorder, it looks a lot like that uh, because a lot of times people will have fear about an illness or about catching an illness because of germs. Um, one of the ways to differentiate with uh, OCD between an illness anxiety disorder is that um, uh, somebody with OCD usually has obsessions about something else just besi besides just their health. So it's about other things as well. Uh, depression. Oftentimes that's not too tough to discern except for when a, a client has OCD about suicide. And so I've seen a lot of, that's a typical um, obsession that clients will have is they are fearful that they might commit suicide or fearful that they would want to commit suicide, but it's different than depression because with depression, clients sort of feel a sense of relief of being able to think of, of um, suicide or see it as a solution. Um, maybe aren't bothered by it. A client with OCD that has a fear or has thoughts of suicide are terrified that they can't stop thinking it. So that thought keeps ruminating in their mind and they're um, scared and overwhelmed by that thought. And then the last one is uh, OCPD, which is Obsessive Compulsive Personality Disorder. Oftentimes these clients don't show up for treatment, right? Because they follow a whole lot of rules, but they're not too distressed by the rules. And so uh, the, the rules don't cause them anxiety. It's a per person that um, seeks perfection, um, but it's usually their family members that are more bothered than they are. We're not gonna land here very long, but I do wanna make sure, especially with all, a lot of people treating children, um, that you're aware of pandas and pans. And this is a syndrome that it comes on really quick. Uh, the OCD symptoms, excuse me, come on very quick. It's a result of having strep or other infections as a child. And so when their children are between the ages of three to 14 years old, they can have a rapid onset of OCD symptoms and a um, rapid behavior change. And so you can see that up there. Um, and PANS is the same thing, only not connected to strep. So it'd be an infection. 
And again, we're not gonna land there very long other than to say, if you see a child that comes in and they've not had any history of the anxiety or of OCD symptoms and the mom says they had strep last week and suddenly they're really sick like this, then you would want to be um, sending them back to their pediatrician because they would need treatment with antibiotics and um, IVIG before they would be able to get treatment that would be effective through um, psychological treatment. And so. It is something chemical that happens, although it's very much, it, um, even once it's treated, it doesn't uh, just dissipate and go away. So but you need to get the strep. And, and yes, but you would, so you would need to go uh, and have it taken care of or send them back to a pediatrician to get medically treated first before they would come in for therapy. Okay, but I know you want to go on this quick, but um, my grandson who had a lot of asthma, so not, I think maybe had strep a couple of times, but mostly asthma, and of course your steroids. It's been about a year, at about four years old, he started, I mean his, it seems great because his room is perfect, all his toys are perfect, mm -hmm. all his clothes are hung up. You know, so right now it's just great. No one of those sisters yeah. don't mess up his room. But I'm wondering <laughs> now if that may be connected to asthma meds or asthma meds. <coughs> like should, should my son and daughter-in-law even bring that up to the doctor or right now is it just a knee free? And I don't know that it would necessarily be related to the asthma meds, but if he's had a lot of infections that have led up to the, that have been a, um, like a secondary part of the asthma, I would probably bring that up with my pediatrician and just to check, um, yeah, to see if it could potentially be some pandas or pans. Yeah, that's a good question. So who has OCD? Um, research shows that males and females have it about equally, um, although males tend to show or display symptoms earlier. Um, the mean age is 19.5 years. That really could be in large part um, due to that's when a lot of stressors happen. And so while it tends to come on gradually, that uh, different than pandas, uh, uh, that it comes on gradually when it's OCD, not related to strep, that um, the, uh, but at 19.5 years old, we typically are what? Going off to college, um, becoming more independent. We're having more life stressors, and so that often exacerbates or when it, that's when OCD shows up. I have lots of um, young or lots of moms um, that after their first child, it will show up because of the increased stress. Two to five percent of the population has OCD. That means that in any given year, 3.3 percent um, a million or 3.3, excuse me, million Americans have OCD. It's a lot of people. Uh, another really interesting statistic is that um, from the International OCD Foundation, they state that from onset to di proper diagnosis and treatment, it's an average 17 years for clients. Um, so I'm really, again, it's uh, such a passion for me. I love treating OCD in large part because you can have such an impact in people's worlds. And so I'm glad you all are here to be able to participate and help with that too, so. All right, so on average, one in every 200 kids has OCD. And this is an interesting statistic because this means that OCD in kids is as prevalent as diabetes. One to three percent of children worldwide have OCD, so that means that in any given year, the United States alone has one million kids with OCD. And while children and adults show similar symptoms, children tend to have worse insight, and men and women have the same likelihood of um, having OCD, but boys have an earlier onset of symptoms. Some of the challenges of diagnosing in children with OCD is just um, that one is that the uh, obsessions are often more difficult to diagnose because like what Lauren was saying, that they have less insight and they um, aren't le as good of historians, right? They can't art articulate it as well. Um, there's also a secrecy and shame that happens for kids because if you're experiencing something that your friends are not experiencing, they're much more likely to not be disclosing that or sharing it. Also compulsions, this is a good thing in some ways that helps us because the compulsions are often observable. They're not mental compulsions and we will talk about that a whole lot more um, in just a minute. But 
The other piece that makes it difficult to diagnose is that there's some inconsistencies. And so as adults with OCD, they tend to, as I said, land in a handful of core areas of obsessions. Kids tend to have them in a little bit more variability, especially based on their developmental ages. So some indications of OCD in children, um, things that you might be watching for or pick up on are preoccupations with germs, dirt, or being sick, um, repeatedly expressing doubts, preoccupation and fear of parents getting hurt. Um, that would be checking on their parents. Again, it gets messy because that sounds like separation anxiety, right? Um, symmetry, order, and exactness, and an excessive need to know or remember facts that seem very trivial. Again, sounds a little bit like autism to me. Um, excessive attention to detail and excessive fear of that something bad will happen or thoughts or urges of harming others. Indications of compulsions. Um, they, again, tend to be behavioral instead of mental. And so you can see on here excessive hand washing, repeating checking behaviors, following self-imposed rules of order. So that looks something like if they have a bad thought, then maybe they don't get to have ice cream later. But it's a self-imposed. It's a rule that they, um, gets made up in their mind. Counting, ordering, and numbering, grouping items together, kind of what you were talking about even. Um, sometimes it seems very nice because your child will keep their rooms clean, um, but really make an indication of a, a bigger problem. Seeking reassurance by asking same questions over and over and repeating numbers, words, or sounds, or music. There are three components of OCD, and this becomes an, a very important part for us to be able to um, figure out or to understand these differences because they help uh, drive our treatment. And so triggers, triggers are really neutral items. So triggers are uh, things like the doorknob, throwing a piece of trash away, um, the color purple. Um, triggers are anything that if I'm faced with this and I end up with having this obsession, that's what a trigger is. So the triggers, if, if I'm faced with this thing, the obsessions are the things that cause us the intrusive thought or the intrusive image that comes up in our mind. So the obsession is not something within our power or within our control. That increases our anxiety because that, um, that intrusive thought is disturbing, makes anxiety and distress go up, and then the compulsion is anything that we're doing to try to solve that, anything we're trying to do to bring that anxiety back down. 